going to talk about Flexbox tonight. Um, uh, as I put in the description, um, I'm, I'm, I'm normally kind of old school up until recently, uh, doing all my layout and loads and positioning and whatnot. Uh, recently, I've started moving to Flexbox, and so we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, you can't do this all the time. There's still situations where trying to move to Flexbox would be a terrible idea. Uh, we'll talk about that briefly. Uh, but what we'll focus on is I've got a number of, of samples for you guys. Uh, whenever we're done, I'll post a link to all the samples. They're up on GitHub already. I'll post a link to them so you can go take a look at them. And all that. Okay? Uh, so feel free to interrupt me at any point. Just do a question or want to discuss something further. Feel free to raise your hand. It's totally cool. As a former teacher, I'm totally used to getting interrupted. As a father, I'm also used to getting interrupted, so it's cool. Uh, I actually don't work anywhere right now. I was a teacher at the Iron Yard, as some of us were discussing earlier, but it went under. I have in my email a DocuSign link to sign papers to be employed somewhere, so I guess this will be changing soon. But hey, right now I'm really enjoying it. Okay, so that's entirely on the wrong screen. Let's see. Let's go over here. All right. So the source code today, uh, it's going to be, uh, some of it is just going to be, hey, here's how Flexbox works in this really ugly thing that just shows the principles. Uh, but there will be part of it uh, where we're going to mimic at least a small part of this website, Project 202. They have a local Dallas office. I didn't ask permission to do this. Um, they do not endorse me, nor do I endorse them. I don't know. I just thought their website looked nice. And so we're going to talk about how you would build this layout in Flexbox. And also, I picked something else that was even easier, uh, which is down here. How would you do this in Flexbox? But other than that, we've got a number of samples to, to work through as we go. Now let's go ahead and get that subject of should I use Flexbox at all out of the way? Uh, Flexbox, should you use it, is really a, a question of browser support. What do you have to support? That really is the question, as is often the case for things in CSS. So for Flexbox, it has some support in IE 10 and 11, but if you have to support anything before that, don't use Flexbox. Go back, use floats. They work great. They work everywhere. They're a little painful sometimes, but they're great. Uh, in terms of Edge, hey, full support. Uh, Firefox, Chrome, they've had them for a long time. Uh, Safari, let's see how mobile's doing. And the Android browser has had it for a while, and there's some um, old, there's an old specification of Flexbox, and that's part of the problem why you see a lot of this yellow in here. Let's see, what about iOS? Where is iOS? iOS, iOS has had it for a while. Most everybody's on. 11 at this point anyway. So, If you're covering a modern browser market, you're good. If you are dealing with perhaps um, you know, the average Joe, which may still be running Windows XP, um, no, it's a terrible, terrible choice, don't use it. Go back and use Flux. Now, assuming you want to use Flexbox, let's talk about how it works. So I've got all the source code up here. All right, that's probably too big, and that's too small. All right, how does that strike you? Is that bigger? That's fine. Right. Anybody want bigger? Okay. All right, we'll go with that then. Uh, this is some of the content from the Project 202 site. We're going to get to that in a second. So. What I've got is I've got a set of HTML and CSS files here for us to work through. So let's start by talking about Flexbox. Uh, first of all, Flexbox is a display property. If you've done much CSS, and uh, actually I should ask this, who here is pretty comfortable with floats, for example? Okay. Um, who knows what inline block is? Okay, cool, cool. So Flex is a different type of display. When you put something in display flex, you're basically shifting into a new flexible box model. It's, it's quite a bit different uh, to the stuff that you're probably used to. So let's do this. If we look at this first file, which is right here, all right? 
take a look at this right here. If you were to look at this div, all these divs here that just have numbers in them, you would expect, okay, a div by default is going to be a block level element. Characteristics of block level elements are, if you have a block level element, it will by default take up 100% of the width of its container. If that container is the whole page, which is the case here, uh, then that means it will span the entire width of the page. If it has no content, it will still be 100% wide. It will take up the entire width of the page. It will, however, have no height, because the height of a block level element is determined by its content by default. Uh, but the width is going to go ahead and take up 100% of the width of its container. And so here we have these divs uh, without any styling other than to make them into boxes, which puts borders on them and gives them specific colors. If you want to look at that, it just looks like this. Here's a box style. I just set the font, text align the center, set the big font size, uh, and then background colors for everything. And for those, just in case any of you are colorblind, uh, I tried to make some good contrasting colors here, if you don't see the colors. So you've got colors and you have numbers. And so this order is going to be very important in a minute. Okay? So going from also, if you like the colors, you want to pay attention to those from hot to cold in terms of the colors. All right. If you go from this right here, which is just a bunch of divs, and you do just this one thing. You wrap all of those divs without changing any of their styling, and then change the parent style to display flex. You get pretty radically different behavior. This right here, which was divs, became this. Okay? So what happens? Well, let's talk terminology first of all. Whenever you set display flex on something, what this does is this is what's called a flex container. And so this becomes the context from which all the flex stuff happens. All the immediate children, not grandchildren or anything like that, all the immediate children of that element uh, become what are called flex items. And their layout is now going to shift into the flexible layout module part of CSS3. And so to make these work like flexbox things, flexbox items, you don't have to change them at all. All you got to do is set the display flex on the parent. And that means all of its immediate children will behave in that way. And if you have a child that isn't even an element, it will still basically wrap it in a, a, in a logical element. So it becomes a flex item too. So it doesn't even have to be an actual element. It can be a text element, a text, a text node. It's totally fine. Okay? So there's the flex container, which is the thing that holds everything, and then there's the flex items. Alright? Now, before this, whenever they were just divs, uh, we discussed their content size, well, the, the height of the div was zero if there was no content, the width is still 100%. So the height was entirely dependent on the content size. At least at this point, with just these settings right here, uh, the height and the width is going to be defined by the content, which is quite a big change from what you're used to with block level elements. And apparently I'm zoomed in. There we go. That's good. And also, and this is one of the main reasons I always use Flexbox, or why I use Flexbox, or most of the time when I ever use floats is notice how once you turn the parent into a flex container, all of the items get aligned horizontally. Okay? So in all of those cases, we're like, wow, I need a two-column layout. It's time to use floats. Um, this is one of the big things that Flexbox is going to solve. Okay? And one thing it solves really easily, where before, if I wanted to actually make all of these set up next to each other, well, one thing I could do is I could set all of these to display in my block, and then we'd all be, I don't know if I could get that behavior. Uh, if I want to do it with floats, I could set them all with floats. But at least with floats, you're going to have some level of issues. Guys, uh, you guys familiar with, with parent collapse? I've talked CSS Lab floats here before. Um, let's see. 
let's give this a, a color. So we can see here that the parent still, it, it's a block, it's, well, I guess it, it would still itself be considered a block of Owen, I guess. It's going to span the entire width, though the children are small and kind of over there on the left. If I were to, just to make this easier right now, take all those out, see I've still got it there. If I was to do this and say, go left, save that. Now I gotta take this off. Right? I have some other side effects. One of those side effects, uh, well, two. First of all, the float takes it out of the page flow, and that doesn't quite work the same way in Flexbox, which is nice. And two, notice that yellow backdrop background disappeared completely. And the reason why is because whenever you float all the children of an element, it can't figure out its own vertical size because it has no children that it's, that it's calculating, so therefore it has a zero height. And so that's why it disappeared. Flexbox, you don't have nearly as many of those kind of side effects that you do when you're dealing with floats. Okay. So it's nice. And you get some new capabilities. So it's not just about getting rid of some of the side effects. Any questions about that before we move on? Okay, cool. Now here's the same example, except I added more text. And I added more text to all of these so that they would be large enough to fill the entire screen. Okay. So that's the only difference between this and this. There's, there's no CSS changes there at all, and now we see them filling all the way to the edges. Okay. And so the size, as I mentioned earlier, of these flex items by default, if you don't set anything, is going to be entirely based on their content. And so we only get 100% width because, in this case, because we actually put a bunch of content in there. It's easy to fix in a minute. We'll look at the properties we're doing. All right. So by default, whenever you shift something into Flexbox, it turns it into essentially from a vertical-based orientation, it's going to automatically turn it into a horizontal-based orientation. What you have, well, the term for that in Flexbox Lingo is the axis. Whenever you go ahead and you set up a flex container by default, it will have an axis of a, a horizontal axis. Or if you look at the property called flex direction, which we're about to look at, it's a flex direction of row, meaning I'm creating a row, please stick everything on this row. That's the basic idea. So, changing the axis with flex direction. All right, so here we have the same bits where we have display flex. The only difference is this one property. If I change this to row, then this is going to look just like this example right here. So this is the one that I just changed to row. If I change it back to column, then what Flexbox does, row says my axis is this way, so line up everything along this axis. If I do flex direction column, then my axis is going to be like a column, so line up everything on the column. Okay? So those are your two values, at least for now. We'll see a couple more later on. So row has your axis going horizontally. Column has your axis going vertical. Okay? How's that strike you? Questions about that? It's not so bad yet. Okay. All right. So, if we want to have six items on a row, and we want them to wrap and to make either two columns or three columns or whatever, then we need to have a way of setting size and telling it to wrap. Back in the float land, all you need to do is set size. You didn't have to tell it to wrap. It would wrap if you just ran out of space. Often when you didn't want it to wrap, it would wrap anyway. Uh, Flexbox is very, very different. So let's get this out of the way and now looks at, look at uh, Okay. So once again, this first example is, is the other plain Jane. It's flex container with no other style, just for <coughs> purposes of how it was before. Now let's talk about flex spaces. 
what I've done on all of these is I've said I want uh, their flex basis, meaning uh, your basis for calculating their size. I want their flex basis to be 33.33%. So in other words, the idea would be generally when you're going to do something like this is you want a three column. You want 100% width. And so therefore you set everything to 33.33333% and then you're going to have it wrapped so you can get multiple rows and, and whatnot. That doesn't actually work in Flexbox. You actually have to tell it you want to wrap when you want to wrap. Otherwise, it will basically force you into not wrapping. Um, I, I don't know why they did that. My guess is because of the uh, years of being scarred by floats wrapping when you didn't want them to because of the one pixel width that you didn't realize you had on there somewhere. That's my guess. I don't really know. But the flex wrap, which is another property where you can say, okay, flex wrap, wrap. If you have those same 33.33% you get this, okay? If you monkey with them, change those to 50%, then you're gonna get your two columns. It's not bad, you just have to remember two properties if you want wrapping columns. The default for this is no wrap, which means don't allow any wrapping at all, no matter what. Just find a way and stick it all in there. So that's basis and wrap. Now, if we know those things, I think we can try to practice with something. All right. So this is uh, that little bit from Project 202. Uh, that's specifically, uh, let's see, this section of the page. I didn't try to get their actual font. Um, but I did steal their pictures. And I got close on the colors. So let's go lay that out. And I've already done the layout. So let's, uh, let's comment that out. So, well, their site's gonna be fine. Now, okay, here we go. So here it is. So we still have the typography still in place and the colors, I didn't comment out any of that. In this CSS file, all this is is the Flexbox layout stuff. All right, so I've commented all that out. We're going to go take our knowledge of our extensive knowledge in Flexbox and figure out how to lay this thing out the way it was. Back to this two-column layout. Okay. All right, so let's do it. So let's first look at our HTML. I mean, you got to know what you're what you're styling. So I have this case studies area. And it has this H2 and this paragraph at the top, and then there's this gallery. And so inside the gallery is items. And so we want this to be like top left and top right and bottom left and bottom right, two column left. So let's do it. The gallery itself, because, because the gallery is the parent element to these things that we want to lay out, all right? That means the gallery itself becomes the flex container, okay? Now, with just that change, it's automatically, just like we saw before, we're gonna put, try to put everything in a four column layout, okay? Which is obviously not what we want, but it does get us in the direction that we want to go. So, what do we know? We know that if we want to hit the items themselves, we can say flex basis. If we want two columns, well, that means 50%. And you can use uh, pixels, you can use M's, anything you normally would set with, but you can use that. So, 50%, which is fantastic, except it doesn't wrap. Why didn't it wrap? I tell it to. Now, one of the things you're going to get used to is uh, which one do we put the wrapping on? Uh, do we put it on this one or do we put it on this one? And the wrap actually goes on the parent. Because what you're doing is you are um, basically setting a behavior for all of the children. And so, therefore, you just set it on the parent. Which I think makes sense. Okay? And there's that. Now, if we wanted to space them out a little bit at this point, I think we would just 
go old school, and if I just add a little margin to the bottom, and so I've got that. Now, one thing that's different about our bit here is that there's there's a spaced out, which is kind of cool, and ours is not spaced out, which is kind of not cool. We could solve this by adding padding, for example, in the items, or we can talk about something else with Flexbox and then do it that way. And so that's what we're going to do. So let's now go back to here. Uh, any questions about that when we move on? Cool. Okay. Time to talk about justify content. So in this example, All right, so if we go to the same stuff we've been having, it's just a bunch of boxes. I've said a flex base is 30% on everything, okay? And it's got a flex rep, which means it's gonna be 30, 30, 30. So this is a total of 90, so we should expect some space on the right hand because it's not 100%. That's all works. And so, but it, we do set it to wrap though, so therefore, this can't fit up here because you know 90 plus 30 will be over 100. So at that point, it's just traffic. So this is this is default behavior in terms of justifying content. So what justifying content is for is for basically justifying content on the axis. Okay. There is another axis that's coming up, a cross axis. On the normal axis, justify content is for laying out things that you would put here. Um, and it's in, you know, similar to what you might be used to for like justification word, you know, left, right, whatever. Except it's not quite the same terminology. So by default, the, ju the justified content value up here is flex start. And so uh, if we were to do this, if we were to say justify content and go flex start, it actually wouldn't be any different because that is the default value. If on the second sample we look and we say flex end, what that means is it's essentially going to be what we write, what we call right align. The reason why they don't call it left and they don't call it right is if when you do flex direction, right now it's a row and everything is stacking towards the right. If you do flex direction column, then the axis is going down. And flex start is at the top and flex end is at the bottom. So left and right won't work as terminology. You have to know what your starting axis is. And your start of your axis in the row layout is on the left. So they call it flex start. And it ends on the right, so it's called flex end. This is, I think, legitimately confusing. But the reason why they had to do this is because they allow you to change the axis. And they had to come up with a terminology that worked with both setting things to go horizontally versus setting things to go vertically. I didn't make it, so it works. Um, anyway, so this is flex in and why they called it that. Flex center, which looks just like just by content center. Um, or not flex center, just just by content center. Uh, does what you would probably expect. You get space on the left and you get space, uh, space on the left and space on the right. Now these two down here are the ones that we can use to finish up our Project 202 project. And so if you do justify content space around, what it will do is it will basically come up with all the space, divide it equally between here, 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 and here. Okay, so we'll put the space around them all, not at the top, because this is about horizontal, not vertical because we are in row mode here. And so, yeah, space around, put space on the outside and in between. If you do space between, then there's no space on the outside. So if whatever you're laying out, if you need it to be flush along the edge, then you do space between. And so the space will just go in the middle right here, okay? And that's all there is for that. So let's go apply this to here. So if we go back with our project 202 example, we can look at this and say, okay, so the items. 
So before what we did is um, we set the flex basis to 50%. If we set it to, let's say, 45%, that's still going to keep it two column, but that means there's going to be an extra 10% left over for us to put a space in. Okay. So now if we look at here, um, everything shifted over a little bit to the left and also Trump a little bit. So now what we can do in the parent, because how you lay out, how you justify the content of the flex box has to do with the parent, has to do with all of them. That goes up here. And we say, let's do start with space between first. So that'll put all the space here in the middle. Yeah. And then around, moved it in a little bit, and of course took away some of the space there. Okay. Any questions about that? And that right there gets you with, I think, everything I've ever actually used on, on Flexbox. I don't think there's ever been a problem I've had to solve. No, there's been one other problem I've had to solve. All right, we can do that. There's a lot of Flexbox, there's some really cool things you can do that I can't ever imagine using, but it's cool. Um, but that right there will give you, get you most of the way. Uh, there's something, when we talk about cross axis that I have used, which is really useful. So let's talk about cross axis. So in here, I put these text nodes in here just so there could be text and we could show some interesting things here. So let's pull that up. Let's see, that would be line items. So justify content, a lot, basically organize content on the plan of the axis. If you have a situation where not everything is the same height and you need to organize things vertically, which at that point what you're on is you're, call, you're on what is called the cross axis. And so if you do uh, flex direction row, your axis is horizontal, your cross axis is vertical. If you do flex direction column, axis is vertical, cross axis is horizontal. Yeah, okay. So let's take a look at this. Align items is for your cross axis. So if we take this first example where we have a big box and a big box with text here at the top. Um, I've got here up at the top, let's see. Yeah, so this is gonna be the default. See how the yellow box is the same size as the red box and the text is just kind of sticking up there at the top. If you put a flexible size on these boxes, like min height, not height, but min height 100 pixels and min height 200 pixels, the default value for a line items in Flexbox will actually cause them to stretch. And the value for that is actually called align items stretch. Okay? So the behavior matches the name pretty well. Okay. Now if you uh, change it to something else like flex start, then you actually get different behavior. That's the next example. So for alignment, which is on the cross axis, and all of our examples here are on the, just for simplicity's sake, because uh, I don't know if I could say it straight, I had to keep switching back and forth. Um, the align items has to do with the cross axis, which means it's the vertical. And by default, what, what Flexbox is gonna attempt to do is stretch everything in the container to get to a uniform height for the entire row, which, is really awesome because this was one of the huge weaknesses of floats. If you had to float a bunch of items and you wanted them to be the same size and you couldn't guarantee what content was going to be in them. Oh, that was so painful. In Flexbox, it's a solved problem. Favorite thing, right? Okay, so by default, it is stretch. However, you can control it. A line item select start will say, okay, go ahead and calculate your size, your height, instead of stretching everything, calculate what your height would actually be normally, and then align them according to the flex start. Now, going back to what we were discussing before, 
when we're talking about the normal axis, flex start was on the left and flex end was on the right. When we're talking about the cross axis, flex start is at the top and flex end is at the bottom. Which means if you align everything to flex start for align items, that means everything's at the top because that's what the start of the cross axis is. Jeez, this gets complicated. But if you do it to the flex end, then everything gets aligned toward the flex end. If you do flex center, and this is also super duper awesome in flex box. If you want to actually center align everything and vertical aligning and CSS is hard. Uh, if you want to do this, it's easy. All you got to do here is do it align item center. And it will basically figure out you know, all the heights and center everything appropriately. If you want to, and in this case, that means everything ends up being at the top in this particular example. Uh, if you want to do baseline, it will find the baseline of the text. And it'll actually align this. So that's, that's there. In terms of a more realistic example, um, here you go. Here's kind of layout that you might see. Pictures on two sides or something like that and some stuff in the middle. I'm using a line center here, if I recall correctly, to make, make this here. All right? If you don't have this and you've got three floated items, what are you going to do? You're going to like add some position relative, push it from the top or something, or you're going to add some padding at the top to push it down, and you've got to monkey with the sizing or something like that. Um, Flexbox makes this pretty easy. This is kind of nice. Okay, any questions about any of that stuff? No? Okay, charging on. Let's see. I'll talk about some things I've never used before. Just because they are part of Flexbox, and they're interesting, and you might need them, but I, I've never actually used them myself. And then what we're going to do is we're going to practice a little bit more on that um, Project 202 set. All right. In the case of alignment, as we were just talking about, align content. Align content was a value that we actually put on the parent element. Uh, let me go show you an example to make that clear. Here you go. We put align items select start, and then that affected all of the children. What if you have one element within all of the elements that you want to align differently than all of the others? Well, they actually have a solution for that. So apparently enough people had a problem with it. It's called align self. So here's this example where I have flex start on the parent. So there everything, therefore everything by default is all the way at the top. However, this one right here that is different. I put align self flex end, and that made it show up at the bottom. So if we were to take it and we were to change it to something like center, then that's going to shift up to the middle. Or of course, like start. Um, we'll just put it up at the top because that's where, where everything else is. Okay. So if you need to for a one-off, I'm sure there's uses for it. Uh, you can do it. Okay. Align self, and because that has to do with an individual item, that's not on the parent. It has to apply to an individual thing. Okay. Let's talk about reversing things. So flex direction, row, basically started the, the flex start at the beginning and the flex end at the end and started basically putting things one at a time on the flex start. It would be cool, I guess, if you wanted to, to say whenever we put this into a row, I want you to put it in backwards. So here's everything, one, two, three, four, five, same divs as before, no changes there. Except instead of row, I changed it to row reverse. And so what that did is that moved the flex start to the reverse, to the opposite side of the screen. Okay. And then it went in reverse. It did the first one, the second one, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I read that this is sensitive to right to left languages. I haven't tested it, but which is interesting. So I guess if it was right to left language, it would actually be over there. But still. That's what that's what flat, that's what row reverse does is it switches it into row mode, but adds everything starts the flex start over on this side, and puts everything starting there and moving to the left. Same thing with column reverse. All right, instead of one two three four five six, 
it starts stacking. This is the flex start, and that's the flex end, and it moves up. Has anyone ever had to do that? Given you have the elements on the page, I can't change the page, therefore, but I have to change the order into reverse, so I have to do it in CSS. Okay, well, so I need it, so. Uh, now, if, once again, you need to completely rearrange the order of things, and you cannot change the HTML, all right? It's cool, you can totally do that in Flexbox. There's a property called order, where you can manually specify the numerical order for all of the items, and so, you can do it. Somebody, somebody had to do it. That's, that's the only reason why that's going to be in here. Somebody had to do it. All right. And another thing, uh, flex grow and flex shrink. I understand flex grow. I'm not even sure I understand flex shrink. Flex grow, basically what you do with flex grow is you set proportional values. So with flex grow, if we look at all of these boxes, I set all of them to a flex grow of one. So proportionally, they should all be the same size. That's that first row. In the next set of things, I change that up. I have a one, and then a three, then a one, then a two, then a one, then a two. So the three should be three times larger than the one, and should be you know, obviously larger than the two. And so that's this row right here, where this is the one I set to three, so it's larger than the one and the three. Before, that's the one I set to two. And so if you want to think proportionally, instead of percentage-wise, you can do that. That's possible. I don't know how you would do wrapping there, honestly. I really don't. How does that flex grow work? Do they like total up all the numbers and give and then break it into percentages from that? Uh, my assumption is that they calculate the total width of the element. Then they calculate the total children and then distribute the available size to the children. That's how I would do it. That'd be my assumption. And that does, you know, if it is flexible. So if you change this, it will move up. It's fine. And you know, percentages would do the same thing. If you want to flex, if you want to do this with a, with flex basis, you totally could. The math would be a little bit harder because you'd actually have to go and figure out percentages. And you know, depending on how many boxes you'd have, you might have to get a calculator out to get them all. But so flex grow makes that easy. Uh, I've never actually used it, but it is there. Then there is a flex shrink thing, which, like I said, I've never actually used. Except for right now. Um, I put a flex shrink on this one and it shrunk and everything else took up available space. So if you're interested in flex shrink, I totally recommend you take a look at it. Because I can't really help you. All right, I also have some resources here. Um, let's go back and look at this case study a little bit more. Uh, what I want to do is I want to make this, throw in a media query to move this to a single column layout. With Flexbox, this is easier, is easier than it was with floats. And um, then we'll do that also with this bottom portion, which is supposed to be this, um, this bit down here. All right, so we'll finish this up before we do that. So what did they do on their set? Well, eventually they went to a full width. We're going to do something like that. They've got some, they're applying some, some funky JavaScript to their images, and we're not going to do that because we're a, uh, we're totally cool. So I'm just going to shift this into a basic one column layout. The image may or may not span the entire width. We'll see. So let's see, that's the layout. OK. Back to where we were. So how did we do the layout before? Well, we turned the parent into a flex container by doing display flex. Uh, we told it to wrap. So if we ever run out of size, we're going to wrap, and we set the flex basis to 45%. So then whenever the third one tries to add on, it's going to be way over 100%, and so therefore it has to wrap. And so that's how we did our two-column, two-row layout. If we wanted to throw in a media query at a smaller screen, we could do something like this, screen and max width, um, some pixel size. And at this point, we could apply different styling. Now, we can actually go different ways with this. Um, if we go back to the very first thing we looked at in Flexbox, which is the flex direction, uh, what we could do is, first of all, think, and we're not going to be doing rows anymore. We're doing columns. 
So we could just go the route of doing this. So I'm going to keep the display flex, but I'm going to change the flex direction to column. And so let's go take a look at that. Refresh. And that shifts it to column. Okay. Now what's strange about this to me personally is I this this flex basis of 45% is still in there. It's not affecting the width. It may be because this is actually meant to do the height because we are changing the axis. What I would do actually in this case, so I would probably do something like this. Set it back to its automatic value, which in this case has no visual difference, but it makes me feel better because uh, it makes sense to me. So here we go, I shift, and you know, it would just be bigger. Let's see if that works. Okay, sweet, okay. So we got that grainy images, yay. Um, somebody really needs to fix their line height right there. But we're doing flexbox, so we're just Okay, let's talk about this bottom piece. It's going to be similar stuff as before, but it'll still be good. It's a good exercise to go through it again. So let's look at our HTML. So what we have is a section called locations. That's what I have the background color attached to. Um, if you look at the Project 202 site, Notice how, even though the browser is you know, quite a bit bigger than the size of this content, the content doesn't keep going, right? So it seems like they're doing something to keep everything centered, yet not go 100% width until you get to a certain point and then things start shrinking. Okay. Uh, the, the typical technique for that is to uh, do basically this. All right, so I've created this class. This is one of the reasons why this is here. If you set a max width, not a width, because then it wouldn't be flexible, a max width, which means when you shrink it, it will, it will go small. Uh, let's say we set a max width of 800 pixels. Okay. Uh, what that's going to do on ours is that's going to make Container styling right there. Make him go away so we can work through this. All right, back where we're at. I've set the maximum width to like 800, which means it's going to be like, I don't know, somewhere right, right here. So typically, when you make these centering containers, uh, you, do, you set a max width and then you set a margin, whatever, zero in this case, and auto. By setting auto to the left and the right, Essentially, what you do <clears throat> essentially what you do by setting it to auto is you say, okay, whatever my width, I get my max width, which means we have, you know, yay much space that we could put on either side. And by setting auto, it divides it into puts puts it there on the left and the right and centers it. That's pretty much the typical way of, of doing it, and that's how. If you go poke around on a Project 202 site, <coughs> oh, let's do it. Let's go steal the source code. If you go look at, uh, let's see, what is it? They used UE. I don't know if UE normally requires all this stuff, but there's lots of extra divs here. Uh, see page content. This is the one of the classes they use a lot, where they set the max width of 1020 pixels, 
and a margin zero auto. And then a little padding around the extra edge that also fairly normal. So that's that's how they're doing their centering, that's how they're doing their centering. Okay, back to where we were. So I've set my container to zero auto and I will put the little padding around the edge. And that would and the reason why you do that is whenever you bring things in, you want a little space between the, the edges. So okay. All right, so now we have our centering container. Uh, now what we need to do is we need to do our initial Flexbox layout for these things. So if we look there, we have our container, we have a location, we have a location, and we have a location. And so these are supposed to stack up to the right, like so. So those are the locations. So what we need to do, if we want to control the locations <laughs> with Flexbox, that means we don't put display flex on these items. We go to their parent, All right? So uh, that means we either need to change the container itself or we need to put another div in there. And I'll just give it some really annoying class name like flex parent, because we just need something. Okay? And so that means when we go to our style for the locations, that's the typography. Here we go. Uh, what do we call it? Flex parent? Cool. Display flex. Now I would expect whenever I refresh everything to snap up beside each other. Sweet. It did. Uh, but they're all kind of squished up here on the left. Uh, that's because, remember our first example, their size is going to be debased, based on their content size. I actually want to evenly divide the space between the three, which means I want to say, okay, uh, flex parent, not it, but I want to get all the locations inside. And I want to say flex basis um, 33.3. Hmm. So that should give us a little space there. Okay. Yeah, that's basically it, actually. All right. Now, same thing there. If you want to uh, do a media query, it would be natural to turn this into a um, a flex direction. column. That'll shift it from the row to a column and that'll do it. You can also instead do this. You could set the basis to 100%. I think. I would have to add wrapping to the flex parent for that to work. There we go. But that's lame. So the way you would do it is totally flex direction. Basically, flex box. You want to do something weird? Aha! I've just reversed all the items. <laughs> you can do it. Okay. Power's in your hands. Uh, any questions? Um, yeah. I, I must have missed how it's installed and how. Flex file itself relates to the CSS file. So Flexbox is actually built into the browser. Now what I did, and this might have led to a, a bad impression, is I have for this file, I just have two separate CSS files. Yeah, that, yeah, I noticed that. And that's and the only reason why 
is so I could have one file that was just the typography and the colors, and I could just leave that alone. And we could just focus on the layout. That's, that's all it was. It's totally fine and actually normal to put all of that in the same CSS file. Or organize CSS however you like to, to organize it. So this is all built into the browser? It is. But it's not as of CSS3? Of, uh, it is actually a part of CSS3, which is yeah, pretty old now. I mean, they actually. Years ago, they abandoned the idea of, oh, let's make a CSS4 and an HTML6, and they just kind of went on this evolutionary oh, model of, like, we're just going to keep creating things. an extra thing you had to put in there, extra files. Nope. It's actually just all, all built in as long as you're hitting the right browser stuff. If you okay. use it and something doesn't support it, you're just going to get nothing. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, do you find in practice, I guess, at what point are are people using Flex to a fault? Uh, where, at what point would you say, um, no, you you ought to do this? Maybe in grid is coming, but um, I don't know. I guess I'll leave the question right there. Use it for what it's good at. Um, I mean, CSS like position, you know, position relative and absolute. Those solve problems that Flexbox is not meant to solve, and so you shouldn't try to make Flexbox solve those. Uh, generally speaking, I reach to Flexbox, assuming I'm supporting only certain browsers. Um, I reach to Flexbox when I need to make columns. That's the, basically the normal places I would reach to floats. I would reach to Flexbox. They're good at, at replacing what we would do with floats. There's lots of situations. There's like in the, the example of like a um, like a navigation where you have a, a, link, a list of links and you want to turn those horizontal. That's still just as good doing an inline block if you want to, uh, or even a float. That's easy. Uh, but if you're doing column-based layout, Flexbox is just as easy or easier and more powerful than than, than floats. Now, if you want to use floats and the original uses of floats, where you have like an image floating in this sea of text and you still use floats, which is what they were originally for. Uh, what do you want to talk about? I was just kind of thinking something very similar. It's like thinking specifically regarding like bootstrap grid. Does that kind of push it more towards irrelevancy, I would say? I'm, I'm not a good person to ask because in general I don't like grid systems. Um, but especially with Flexbox, it's Granted, floats were weird for layout. They were legitimately weird. You got used to them, and you did it, and then you're proud of it being able to cover. Um, and so I, that's what I did for years, and I still didn't do um, grid-based layout, uh, you know, grid, grid systems, 960 grid system, whatever. Um, Flexbox is easy enough where I, I don't see the value. Really don't. But I'm also biased against it because I don't use them. I mean, if I'm going to take go to all this trouble to learn floats, darn it, I'm going to use them. <laughs> Except for, for now. And a lot of this is, you know, what, what are you building? That's the question. If you're Amazon and you need to support all the browsers because it affects your bottom line, then you don't use Flexbox. If you look on, if you spell into, in, into Amazon's front end code, if there's some stuff on there, you go, we don't do that anymore. That's crazy. Oh, no, wait, they still support i6. Yes, that is exactly what you would still do. And they should, because if they start chopping off users, then they're going to start losing money, so it makes sense for them. Um, so it all depends on your, on your target market or your users. Anything else? Okay, well, I won't keep you any longer. That's it. Thank you. All right, I'm going to let you guys vote. All right, on three, I want you all to point to the person who asked the best <laughs> questions. All right? All right, I want you to think about it. Uh, I want you to think about it, okay? Think about it. On three. One, two, three. <laughs> I didn't get many fingers. I got, like, right, you got slightly more. Okay, you get the book. I 
I would recommend anyone who uses .NET more should probably take it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I don't want to take it and not use it. Do so. you do JavaScript touching and programming? Um, I am, I'm, I'm pretty early on, but I'm, I'm learning JavaScript, Python, and, and I do web development so at work, but okay. we are .NET shop, but I just have not really, I have not um, really attempted to learn it, but I probably should. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. I, I like that. Let's look at the table of contents. Let's see. Basics of responsive web design. CSS Lab Bootcamp. If you use Flexbox, well, a lot of that's floats. So, uh, flexible layouts, that's still somewhat relevant. Navigation, somewhat relevant. Flexible content, eh, no, that's out of date. That's <laughs> woefully out of date chapter. Um, display modes, view engines, if you're on old ASP.NET, it's valid. This is out of date, it's out of date, out of date. I really like these two chapters. It's my favorites. These are touch programming. And then this is totally out of date, too. So. There's a good solid two chapters in here. There's still this <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there's some stuff here. So if anybody wants it, it's actually more about client side than it is about AIDS, but on any scene. Which was no one of those awkward conversations that yeah, we yeah. had with the publisher. This isn't this is more of a web book, not an AIDS book. Yeah. Does anybody want it? Sure. All right, arm wrestle for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who wants it? <laughs> Given the content, who wants it? It's fine. We can have. I'm gonna. Or I'm gonna do something random here. All right. Three people. Okay. All right. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. Random.org. Max. Let's see if this is uh, inclusive of three. Right, I'm gonna do some sample rows. <laughs> Dude, Joel, you're really winning here. Uh, okay, all right, it is because the next one is actually the winner. All right, you win. <laughs> um, I will push the final version of the source code and I will put a link in the meetup to where that is, okay? Cool. If you have any other questions, uh, you can email me or follow me on Twitter or something like that. So. Are you going to have this in your GitHub? Because I looked for it, of course, I didn't find it. So these, some of these notes, these. I'll, I'll put a link to all this source code uh, in, in the meeting. Just look at the comments. Thanks. I'll do it before I leave, assuming I don't forget. All right, it's me on Twitter. All right? All right, thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you. you.